So as I mentioned, for those who've just joined, welcome to the Healthier Together Champions Lunch and Learn session with a focus on asthma today. My name's Laura Cassidy. I'm Network Delivery Manager and be chairing the session. I'm just going to go through the outline of the session. So we will, if you could please put in the chat your name, organisation and your role, and that'll just obviously give the speakers today an understanding of where people are from and your roles and how obviously this relates to your work. Um, I'll give a bit of a brief introduction to the Child Health and Wellbeing Network and our role and then I'll hand over to Carol and Claire who will introduce themselves who will be covering the asthma awareness session. So just to give a bit of context, I think we'll all be very familiar with the challenges we face in the North East and North Cumbria. Um, we have really high levels of health inequalities and poorer health outcomes for our children and young people. So a lot of the work we do as a child health and wellbeing network is about trying to improve those outcomes through us working collectively and sharing models of good practice. You'll all be aware of the the high levels of poverty in the North East of England and we, you know, we have the highest rates in the country. Um, We've also got, you know, poor rates of uh, some of the highest rates around asthma admissions is in as is really around why we're doing a lot of the work we're doing around kind of that um, prevention and support um, in the wider community to try and address the challenges we have. We also have higher rates of A&E attendances um, and actually have the highest rates in the country for children aged 0 to 4. And that is a lot of the re reason why we embedded Healthier Together within our region. It was about trying to support that wider system and healthcare pressures um, through really empowering our parents through consistent, trusted advice and information. The network. Um, was started in 2018 and it was very much that a shared vision was brought about through working with professionals and children, young people and families to um, bring together our vision and also kind of the ask of the system. So we believe all children and young people should be given the opportunity to flourish and reach their full potential. And that's very much about by working together as organisations. Um, the system asked us to share good practice, drive work forward and connect in expert groups. As you can see on the right, these are our priority areas. Um, I'm sure they'll probably not be of, of surprise to yourselves in that we're all working, you know, to address a lot of similar um, priority areas for mental health, poverty, additional needs and vulnerability, inequalities and in access, strong start in life, health promotion, family support, which was actually added as a result of COVID when we went back out to the system and asked what the th if they were still relevant. And then childhood illnesses is obviously something that we were looking at in relation to long term conditions of children with asthma. The network has um, a broad reach. We have around 2000 members, so we're often sharing um, training opportunities. You can sign up to become a member if you're not already. Um, it's a great opportunity to find out what's happening in across the region, but also those training opportunities um, any things that are coming out nationally as well. We also do things around learning huddles as alongside the lunch and learn. So opportunity to find out what is happening through the huddles as well. We, as a network, we have responsibility for the Children and Young People's Transformation Programme, Integration Centre and Q-Pilot Programme through NHS England. Um, and that's where the asthma remit falls. Um, and I've got my colleague Louise on the call who leads on the asthma work stream. We also do um, have led some work around tackling inequalities and poverty and working with um, colleagues from um, Children North East on the, the poverty proofing in healthcare settings is an example of that and the Youth Mental Health First Aid offer. We also have a um, member of our team who leads on Children and Young People's Core 20 and we've developed a, a, a toolkit around that to support um, organisations to to how to, to look at that and utilise that as a tool to address um, inequalities. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Carol and Claire who are going to lead the session um, and give you that overview of the asthma work and how it can support. So as I mentioned, we've got um, Carol Barwick and Claire Kegel and Louise Dorsey on the call and I'm going to hand over to you now, Carol and Claire. Thank you, Laura. Um, my name is Carol Barwick. I'm a um, community asthma advisor for the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. I'm also a specialist nurse um, for children in respiratory medicine in James Cook Hospital. So I'm a clinical practitioner as well. Um, yeah. 
My name is Claire Cagle. I am a um, community asthma advisor and also a specialist public health nurse for the 5 to 19 service in Stockton. Okay, so thank you very much for this invitation to come along today. Any opportunity to share information and educate on asthma is, is a valid opportunity and thank you for that. Um, what we are here for today, the mainstay of this is asthma is the most common long-term medical condition in children and young people. We know that in this country, one in 11 children live with asthma. The statistics for asthma aren't good in terms of outcomes and certainly the number of children admitted to hospital is the highest rate in Europe. Surprisingly, there are 25,000 emergency hospital admissions, which have some very variables from year to year, however, remain consistently high. During the pandemic, the number did drop, but we are now getting back to pre-pandemic levels. We also know that asthma has a considerable um, impact on ed children's education and is the main contributor to school days lost. Next slide, please. So the impact of asthma is that one in every 11 children in this country has asthma. And what does that mean? Well, on average, that means there's three per class. This is variable throughout the country. And there may be some areas, some rural areas where there's minimal children with asthma and other inner city areas where there could be as many as 50% population. And I've already mentioned the impact of asthma on admission rates in this country. Next slide, please. We know there's lots of um, reports and, and guidelines and papers out on asthma and statistics. The information on this slide here stresses the importance of good timely care for children and young people with asthma. There's concerning facts and figures which are unfortunately showing minimal signs of improving within the NENC, having some of the worst statistics for children and young people with asthma. We need to work together across all sectors to address these deficiencies and to improve our outcomes for children and young people. Apart from the highest admission rates, we know that there's a specific impact on quality of life and these children are coming from the most deprived areas in the country. We know that emergency admissions are strongly associated with deprivation and dis despite the prevalence of asthma being evenly distributed Next slide, please. This slide actually demonstrates the number of admissions over a number of years. And as you can see, North East and Yorkshire are fourth highest for our admission rates. The patterns, if you can look at the patterns, they're very similar throughout the country. And if you look at the years, they obviously mimic each other. So there's a similar, there's a similar pattern happening throughout the whole of the UK. However, um, Northeast and North Cumbria are pretty high. You can see the Midlands are the highest and London is third. We, we need to desperately improve on this throughout the whole of the country. So the number of admission rate, uh, the number of admissions are too high. Next slide, please. Here you can see this is broken down into different areas and, and it's broken down into per 100,000 population. And you can see that North East and Yorkshire have 111 admissions per 100,000. Next slide, please. So what's asthma all about then? Well, asthma is a common lung condition that causes breathing difficulties. It's a condition that has many misconceptions in that it's not serious and it can't lead to any long-term harm. We know that that is not the case with the, with the statistics showing that there are still 20 to 30 childhood deaths from asthma per year in this country. It can affect people of all ages and often starts in childhood and it can develop at any time, even for the first time in adults. The several, the difficulty with asthma is that several conditions can mimic asthma. And so therefore that, that creates quite a significant delay sometimes in the diagnosis and coding of, of, of asthma in a child or young person. Next slide, please. So the difference anatomically in asthma, if you can see on the slide here, is that healthy airways on the left 
and then the changes on the right when asthma exacerbates. It's a number of complex changes within the airway. There's a smooth muscle response, there's an airway lining response, and there's often um, the, the body response to asthma is much is very complicated and is also at cellular level. So this slide is pretty much simplified about what's going on, but there's mostly inflammation and allergic responses going on, tightening, and this is in and this obviously the response to this and the symptoms associated with asthma. Next slide, please. So NHS England and NHS Improvements have been working hard to develop a document called the National Bundle of Care for Children and Young People. And this is in, in response to several audits, guidelines and reports which identified the problems associated with asthma in children and young people. And the mainstay of this comes from the National Report of Asthma Deaths. And this report was based on children and this report came out in 2014 and it was based on children who died in the year 2012 and the outcomes of that report is that it, children are dying unnecessarily of asthma and there's opportunities from all healthcare professionals and any professional in contact with a child with asthma to intervene and potentially change that um, the outcome. Next slide please. So the National Bundle of Care is a whole system approach. It's the focus of the bundle is divided into different strands. The main strand is the organisation of care and leadership and that all systems, professionals and non-healthcare professionals who are involved with children and people with asthma have a whole system approach to the condition. So this may be in a healthcare setting, this may be in a school setting or it might be in a sports and activities setting. Integrated care systems should have a named lead with asthma expertise who are responsible and accountable for the implementation of asthma standards and good asthma practice. We're aware that there's a number of environmental impacts on asthma and all leaders, coaches, etc., should understand the dangers of air pollution, indoor air quality and exposure to smoking and reduce the risk where possible within their settings. Early and ac accurate diagnosis of asthma should be based upon clinical features of a comprehensive history. Diagnosis should be recorded in the notes and coding accordingly. Awareness of signs of asthma and communication with parents and families is essential. And importantly, how to respond to an asthma exacerbation and when to seek medical help. In terms of effective preventative med medicine, all children should have a written asthma management plan. It's been in guidelines for up to 20 years and still in this country, about 36 to 45% of children have a written management plan for their asthma. This is being generally promoted throughout the whole of the country with the hope that this will improve within the next few years. We know that there's a, a number of children who have a small percent of children who have asthma have severe and difficult asthma and it's recommended that each ICS should ensure that children and people with severe asthma are clearly identified and have access to difficult to treat asthma service. Our local service is in the Great North Children's Hospital in Newcastle. It's very important that everyone working closely with children and young people should be, a tr should be trained to the appropriate level and there are now several tiers of training available on e-learning for health, which my colleague will speak about a little bit later on. In terms of data and digital, we want NH NHS data should be shared and used more efficiently. This can help identify variations in care. It can identify prescri prescribing um, variances and allow for monitoring, accurate monitoring of children and also um, we would like to see the, in, in the inclusion of better use of remote consultations and asthma apps and to, which would make it easier for people to attend appointments and self-manage effectively. In school, databases can identify those children with poor attendance and may be utilised to prompt parents to attend for an asthma review. And in primary care settings, we know that there's ability to do audit searches 
and review those children who are having high use of cyber, poor concordance, poor prescription collection, and to ensure all children get an asthma annual, annual asthma review. Next slide, please. There's been significant media co coverage in tragic circumstances. These children on this slide both died of, from the impact of pollution. The Child Health Wellbeing Network objective is communication with local council authorities to raise awareness of the poor quality of housing in some areas of our NENC. Our app, which you can, who you can see here on this slide, passed in June 2023. Sorry, ours law passed in June 2023 in response to AWAB's death. Have now set time limits for repairs on housing. New regulatory standards for landlords to let tenants know just how to make complaints and the stronger powers for the housing ombudsman service to issue good practice guidance to landlords based on the findings from their investigations with tenants complaints and there's new qualification requirements for social housing managers. Ella Kissy Deborah was a little girl who um, died in London several years ago now, but she was the first child in the UK to have on her death certificate the cause of death being related to pollution. Next slide, please. So moving on to the diagnosis of asthma, how, how, is, how is asthma diagnosed and what should be done about it once the diagnosis is made? The process of making a diagnosis of asthma is quite complicated in terms of children and young people often attend uh, appointments at their GP or at ED departments and there's lots of symptoms that mimic asthma. Asthma is based on a careful review Asthma assessment is based on a careful review of the child's current and past medical symptoms, family history and physical examination. It's also based on a pattern over time of certain presenting signs and symptoms. We know that wheeze, cough and coughs in winter are very common symptoms in children and often they're missed as being a variance of asthma or a confirmed diagnosis of asthma. Symptoms of asthma are variable. So it's very difficult to diagnose at times because sometimes children have been significantly unwell through the night, but by the time they have an appointment the following morning or a couple of days later with their GP, their symptoms look very, very different. And it can be very dependent upon seasons and triggers. So it's quite a complex process to make the diagnosis. Next slide, please. So the treatments for asthma, we do have some very good treatment for asthma and the main the main objective for asthma treatment is to control symptoms to the best of our ability. There are reliever inhalers which are taken at the time that symptoms occur or they can be used in anticipation of potential triggers or exacerbation. It's really quite common for children who have asthma or exercise induced symptoms to take the blue inhaler before they exercise. We have several different forms of preventative medication for asthma based upon preventative inhalers. They come in several forms and colours and are taken regularly every day, mostly morning and night, but there's now variants of those inhalers, meaning they may be taken in a different way. Quite new to asthma management are combined inhalers, which have a preventer and reliever. This is known as MART system. So there may be some children who walk around with their inhaler that they've taken for first thing in the morning and they take last thing at night, but also has a medication combined, which means it will relieve symptoms when necessary. The more severe or allergic types of asthma require lots of different inf and additional forms of treatment. These may be in the form of medication, nasal sprays, or in the most extreme group of children with severe and difficult asthma, they may have injectable medication known as monoclonal antibodies or biogenics, which target high IgE levels and reduce symptoms and control asthma. Next slide, please. So here is a slide that shows the very, the very vast and variant different inhalers that we have for asthma. 
many years ago when I first started in this role, it was very straightforward. Blue inhalers were relievers and brown inhalers were preventers. But actually, with the ongoing improvement in asthma management and treatment for asthma, we've now got very, very many different sorts of inhalers. And what I can emphasize here is it's very important that the child and family understand which inhalers do which job. And every opportunity we get to reinforce that is really, really important in terms of ensuring that there isn't any misunderstanding with which inhaler should be used in an acute exacerbation. Um, one of the outcomes from NRAD emphasizes the importance of the understanding of how inhalers work and the identification of the correct inhaler in terms of acute, acute exacerbation. So on the left, you can see in the slide, there's a number of inhaled corticosteroids, which is the mainstay treatment for asthma. They come in different colors. And on that slide particularly, it looks like there are only brown inhalers, but there are also combination inhalers at the bottom of the slide, which also have inhaled corticosteroids, but they're combined with a long acting relief inhaler as well. So you can see how families and children particularly may get a little bit muddled in what their inhalers do and end up carrying the wrong inhaler at times. Certainly when I have visited schools in, in the past and we've looked at the inhalers that have been in school, I've, nearly in every school I've visited, I've been able to identify inhalers that shouldn't be carried. They're, they're inhalers that should have been taken at home and they're not relief inhalers. So the, you may have inhalers in school which are meant for home use and are the incorrect one. So it's worth knowing which inhalers do which job at which time. Next slide, please. A number of inhalers, which are gas propellant inhalers, are used in spacer devices. And again, we've got a wide range of spacers. It's important that children know how to take their inhaler and the inhaler technique is checked at every opportunity that we get. In clinic, this is done right quite regularly, but there's been a recent drive to be working with schools and ensure that schools are aware, school staff are aware of the correct technique for these inhalers, because it's more common than not that children haven't got the correct inhaler technique. This can be corrected quite easily. And in it, the more awareness everybody has of how inhalers should be taken, the more chance that the message is, is reinforced to families and we get it right. Inhaler technique and spacer technique are all available on our regional resource, be asthma website, has lots of exciting sections on how to use inhalers. There's videos on how inhalers should be used and lots of information for different age groups, for schools, for families, and for certainly for young people. Next slide, please. So the management of asthma is that the asthma can be well managed for the vast majority of children and young people. The aim of treatment is to ensure that quality of life is good and that children take part in all the activities that would be expected for their age group. The aim is to reduce weekly symptoms, reduce the need for oral steroids, ensure good concordance with treatment, encourage a good technique and educate and empower children and young people to self-medicate and monitor. Knowing what is good control will prompt early recognition of intervention needed. Self-management by the family and young person is essential. However, guidance during activities can reinforce key messages and support the child and young person. And we need to encourage discussion, discussions and involvement, particularly with children with limitations in exercise. Next slide, please. So how do you manage a child or young person having an asthma attack? Well, it's really important to, to be able to recognize symptoms of what is, what is manageable and what is worrying. In terms of mild to moderate symptoms, symptoms occur of cough, wheeze, short of breath, could be chest tightness. Younger children tend to not report chest tightness, but say they've got sore tummies. And some children just become quieter and less active. In terms of this compared to a child with more severe symptoms, the respiratory rate increases. They seem to be working hard with their breathing. Some children develop the inability to talk in sentences or can only say just a few words without taking a breath. 
some children when they get really unwell can have a color change commonly people believe that there's a blueness that represents the most severe type of change but actually children are most commonly most commonly get quite pale beforehand and in the worst case scenario children become quite distressed or confused these are signs of the most severe type of asthma next slide please so the actions for both groups of children are similar the most important thing is to remain calm and confident with these children we're going to encourage them to sit down and loosen any tight clothing and start to administer their rescue inhaler the guidance has just changed for the amount of blue inhaler that should be administered um, within a within a community setting and that is now restricted to six squirt six doses of blue inhaler and this would be the gas type inhaler the meter dose inhaler that would go in a spacer so you would administer two doses of blue inhaler through a spacer one dose at a time ensuring that the inhaler is shaken between and using the technique which has been recommended by the child's practitioner this can this can keep you can keep going with this every few minutes until you feel there's been a beneficial response for the child or if a child has a combined inhaler, which we've discussed, the MART inhaler, where there's a preventer and reliever, that would be one dose of that inhaler because it's a pretty strong dose of inhaler compared to a blue one. And they can have an extra four doses of that inhaler. We're going to encourage children to breathe at a normal rate. And this would be a child who is having an exacerbation of symptoms. In the red box on the right, you can see that, that those children, the children who have discussed above with the more significant symptoms, these are children we're going to be concerned about. We're going to start giving their blue relief inhaler and we're going to keep giving it every 30 seconds, shaking the inhaler in between. But most importantly, we've asked a colleague to call 999 and be contacting the parent or guardian. We're going to follow the actions of giving regular blue inhaler until the ambulance service arrives. And if the child looks like they're losing consciousness, we're going to follow first aid procedures. This um, algorithm is actually available to post up in schools and it's available on the Beat Asthma website. Next slide, please. So we've discussed that all children should have a written management plan. The example on this slide is the example from the Beat Asthma website, and this is a very good management plan. This is a threefold plan. So what you're looking at is the outside of this particular plan. It's got the name and details of the child on the front and on the back, it's got the triggers so that everybody is aware what of the circumstances that might trigger an exacerbation and also contact details. Next slide, please. The inside of the plan is quite clear in terms of when asthma is well controlled, what asthma symptoms should look like, what medication the child should be on and how often they should take that medication and what would signify an exacerbation of symptoms would move that child from green zone into the amber zone. In the amber zone, it talks about how much medication should be taken, what an exacerbation might look like, what actions should be taken and when the child should seek medical help. In terms of exacerbation of symptoms, if symptoms were unresponsive to the usual recommended guidelines, then that child would be in the red section of the management plan. It offers signs and symptoms of when asthma is more severe, offers information about what actions should be taken, and also when to seek urgent medical help. I'm going to hand you over to my colleague now, who's going to do the, the remainder of the slides. Next slide, please. So we're now going to look at some of the triggers for asthma. So asthma symptoms often occur in a response to triggers. Now, there's lots of common triggers. It's a very long list, um, but not all children are affected by them. Each child and you, each child, young person may have their own specific or individual triggers. For example, we know that there's been children who are allergic to gelatin and um, blue food colouring. So it's just being aware of this list so that you can make your the environment that the children and young people are coming into more asthma friendly. 
and um, things like coughs and colds are going to impact on a child's asthma we know the change in weather smoke pollution and um, carol's already discussed some of these we talk um, with schools around pollution around cars running outside of school and leaving engines running and the impact that can have on children and young people if they've got asthma we've also got our allergies such as pollen house dust mite and um, animals medication some children are allergic to medication and emotions and this is particularly important at this time of year because we've got a lot of children transitioning into a new class or transitioning into a new school or maybe starting school or transitioning into secondary and obviously that can cause some anxiety um, and increase in exacerbation in their asthma we've already talked about mold and damp homes and we now have our abs law and um, you know that housing companies need to be following to support people so children and young people so they're living in better housing and we also know exercise and activity can also have an impact and a trigger on young people's asthma next slide please this is an example and um, following our beat asthma friendly schools pilot that we're going to discuss and um, was developed from the schools so we developed this as a recommendation from one of the schools and it was a seasonal calendar to develop um, about what triggers might impact on what season so it's things that looking like bringing the christmas tree down um, and leaving it outside for a little bit because it's going to be particularly dusty and um, being aware of fire and um, bonfire night and the impact that might have the changes in the pollen and the seasons so schools can either send this out as a poster as a reminder to parents they may have it up in school or they can send each season they can send that out as a little message on their school media facebook site to encourage parents to be aware of it we know that children are going to be trying different foods different, and there's also food allergies and pets and things sometimes in school so there's lots and lots of triggers just to be aware of and actually we haven't seen pets in school for a long time but in uh, one of the pilot schools for the beat asthma friendly school they have actually started recently having pets in or they may have dogs in you know therapy dogs such so just to make the schools to be aware of that 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 could impact some of the children and young people next slide please so sorry i've covered some of that common triggers within schools so again yeah we're talking about pets um, and allergies but it could be that children have pets at home strong smells from paints and glues and um, even chemicals in secondary school you know being aware when children are doing science experiments just to be aware that some of the, the impacts of these may affect the children and young people again house dust might in carpets we know that some schools are trying to now remove um carpets and soft furnishing and having white equipment that they can wipe down and keep clean damp um you know moisture and mold um, we know about freshly cut grass, so we encourage children not to go out and play on freshly cut grass. We also know September, we have a lot of leaves fall from the trees and the mould spores can gather. Um, and so we often say to schools, you know, particularly reception children, they'll send reception children out to go and play and gather the leaves and do leaf paintings and printing. And what we say is this isn't good for children and young people of asthma because the mold spores are on those leaves and it could have an impact. We know that we have a high number of parents who are smoking or vaping in the northeast. So it's about being aware and making sure that we're educating parents and, and young people, because we have young people in secondary schools, even um, you know, year six in primaries who may be vaping. So it's about giving that education cleaning products and aerosols we often talk to secondary schools about not using linked particularly the boys within the changing rooms or the girls because that can impact on someone's asthma after a PE session exhaust fumes like we've said about not leaving engines running and school transport we often talk about school transport not leaving their engines running while they're picking children up and and we know that during the summer schools have had lots of um, maintenance work building work done and obviously that can impact on children and young people coming back into school and those smells might still be still be there next slide please so how asthma can affect education what we know is that children and young people with persistent or uncontrolled or severe asthma are more likely to miss school and this can lead to poor attainment 
um, key stage one, but also within GCSEs, we know that, that you know, children could be more stressed and it can impact on their actual final GCSE results. We're in the middle or the start of the September surge where more children are rushed to hospital due to their asthma. And this is around the changes in um, air, the temperature, around the spores on the leaves, lots of viruses and children are starting to mix together. And also they may not have been in that routine and taking the treatment over the summer. So it's getting back into that routine of taking the medication. We know that asthma is responsible for up to 18% of school absences. And there's a research to support that 86% of children with asthma have at some point been in school without an inhaler. So that may be they don't have their inhaler with them or that actually that the inhaler that they have has actually you know, run out. And there is a big move now to ensure that there is a counter on inhalers so that children can see when their inhaler is getting low to order a new prescription or actually see when that inhaler has run out. Next slide, please. So a, a big part of the um, work that Carol and I have been undertaking around the North East and North Cumbria was a pilot for beat asthma friendly schools. And this scheme was aimed to support a whole school community in understanding and managing asthma. It's specifically for schools and education settings across our North East and North Cumbria. Um, it is available in other areas in a in different format, but we've incorporated the bundle into ours, which is really important around the pollution. We've currently had, uh, we had a pilot of 13 schools and we've had a number of other schools from that. And the plan is to roll this out now to the 1,440 schools. And it's to encourage a healthier, more inclusive environment for students and teachers and staff and parents to feel more supportive that the children is the child are attending a school where staff will know how to deal with um, an asthma attack and will respond to children in the best way that they can. It's ensuring that they're, they're up to date with teaching and training and they're using the current and best practice for um, children and young people with asthma. Next slide, please. This just um, poster explains the nine step process of how a school would become accredited. So they would need to have a, an asthma friendly schools policy. Now we've actually got a policy that literally the school would just have to print off and add the names to have some sort of register that records um, medical issues or the, an asthma register that records all children with who have asthma and what medication they take. Schools were required to have an emergency kit. They weren't aware that they could buy um, a spacer and inhaler to use in an emergency for anybody who's diagnosed with asthma to make sure that if they didn't have their inhaler in school, that that could be given to support them in an emergency situation. We encourage children and young people to have the medication in school um, and somebody to be responsible for checking that so that inhalers are kept up to date and um, in date and that new inhalers are brought back in at the start of term. We also encourage children and young people to self-manage the medication. What we're looking at is in year five or year six, if it's appropriate, if school and parents feel it's appropriate, that those children and young people will be encouraged to encouraged to take their own inhaler because what we then do is they then transition to secondary and are totally responsible and expected to carry their own inhaler. So it's setting them up ready so that they're aware of when they might need to take their inhaler. We also want children to have the personalised asthma action plans in school and schools to ask for that to be brought into school so they know what triggers that child might have and how to treat them um, in an emergency. We're looking at pollution. So we've already talked about the lots of triggers, indoor pollution, outdoor pollution, um, you know, not we've talked about car engines, we've talked about um, children being walking to school but maybe walking on the inside so they're away from the road to reduce the pollution because that dramatically in, um, reduces the amount of pollution that a child will be exposed to on the way to school ensuring that schools haven't got plug-ins or candles or any sort of diffusers and sprays being used. We're looking at a whole system approach. So how schools um, invite parents in, inform parents of if they're an asthma friendly school, you know, it might be open nights, it might be that they have um, display boards within the school, encouraging schools to have children and young people ambassadors. So it might be in some of the schools, what, what they have done is children have um, 
performed an assembly to talk about asthma and how it feels to have asthma. It might be that they just put a board up within school or it might be that they use children from other school groups such as forest skills or um, school councils to look at medical issues within one of their meetings. And the staff training which is available we're going to discuss later on e-learning for health and what we like is 85% of front facing so that staff school staff who are going to have contact with children and young people we would like them to have that that training and we know that it's more difficult in secondary schools because there may be up to 200 staff and some of the schools may have people who come in for an hour so what we want is a majority of staff who um, are front facing and may have contact with those children and young people and next to that is the poster which shows how you would become accredited um, as an asthma friendly school um, and we would come and do a visit once you feel you are ready for validation to look around the school and look up where you are keeping your emergency inhaler and what resources you have available in school. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of the policy. Like I said, it just you can print it off and everything is there. Some of the schools actually um, have their own format because of the academies and the trusts, but obviously that this is the um, information up to date research evidence based that we would like incorporated in it. We know so far to date, I think it might even be even higher now, there had been 590 downloads of this policy. So that's really positive that it has been viewed that many times. Next slide, please. Yep, this just shows the checklist that schools would need to. It's mainly to tick through the checklist, except when it comes to the pollution, we would like some examples of how the school have tackled that pollution. So it might be that they've staggered drop off pickup times, they've got a smoke free and vape free policy in place. And um, the accreditation lasts for three years once it has been achieved. Next slide, please. Um, following the primary from the pilot we have developed um, some resources again from the schools so there's a, a primary and a secondary school assembly that just educates children and young people it can be played it's been recorded um you know what is asthma how to help your friend and what to do in an emergency situation just very short and um, child friendly um assemblies that can, that can be used both a primary and a secondary version next slide please I don't know if people are aware of this. This is just a recommendation that children and young people should undertake 60 minutes of activity per day. We know that a lot of children and young people don't um, always meet that target, but what we know is that um, it builds children's confidence and self-esteem. It helps develop the coordination, improves the concentration and learning, improves fitness and health. It maintains, a, helps children maintain a healthy weight, helps improve sleep, and also helps to make children feel good. We know that some of the schools in the area, they may be doing the um, the active mile where children are encouraged to, to undertake the active mile. And there's other schools have lots and lots of sports activities that children and young people may be involved in. Um, so we try and encourage lots of activity and from that we have gone on to develop a, a sport a beat asthma friendly sports and clubs um, accreditation next slide please what we know is that children and young people do take part in sport we know that um, children who don't have asthma that there's potentially only 50 percent of children and young people who actually achieve the expected um 60 minutes a day we encourage children with asthma to take part in activity. We, it shouldn't exclude them from being included in activity, but we know that 90% of asthma sufferers sometimes may get some symptoms during or after physical activity. Some children and young people may experience symptoms even if they don't have asthma. And we know that there's a higher proportion of exercise induced asthma. So it's having an awareness of that and how you can incorporate that so that the children, young person can be included in the sport. We know that there's lots of elite sports people who are very active and can undertake sport and do really, really well in their sport. And it's using those as role models for children and people to encourage them to say that even though you do have asthma you know these sports people do and you can be you can achieve in your sport 
Children with the more severe asthma causing them to have admissions are less, are less likely to be active, but we know the benefits of sports, so it's about trying to include them. Next slide, please. So we know that exercise can be can be triggered. We can have, there is something called exercise induced asthma. We know that things like the environment can trigger um, children and young people's asthma, particularly cross country and things when children are sent out in the cold. So it's just to be aware that obesity can also have an impact on children's activity in sport. Children with asthma may be more reluctant because they might be frightened to have an attack. And there's also that that they might be embarrassed to take their inhaler or that they're not performing in the team. So they don't want to let the team down, um, you know, particularly if a child is having an attack and they're on a rugby pitch. They don't want to be getting their, their space around maybe and taking their inhaler in front of all, all their teammates. So it's having that impact and making sure that there is somewhere they can take that inhaler. And, and feel comfortable to be able to be encouraged to participate in the sport. Next slide, please. This is just an example of our beat asthma friendly sports and activity accreditation. So it can be any sports club, it can be guides, um, brownies, scouts, um, any sort of club after school club can undertake this. It's next slide, please. It's very similar to the asthma friendly skills, but instead of a policy, there is an inclusion statement to ensure that all children have the opportunity to be included. Again, there'll be an asthma champion or an asthma lead, and then it's very similar. We'd encourage to see a copy of the personalised asthma action plans. And again, the training is also available for those people. Next slide, please. This is just, sorry, I am just conscious of the time. This is just um, a little copy of the inclusion statement to say that we want all children to be able to feel part and participate in it, to feel that they should be able to access their inhalers. We have recently had one of our local sports club, Rankad Gymnastics, has gone through that accreditation and we've got a couple of other gymnastic clubs working through it. So that's fantastic because we're not aware of any sports or activity accreditation or asthma across the country. So this is quite new to our area that we've, you know, we've developed. Next slide, please. And again, it's a, a, tick, a tick list. And again, what we're saying for the sports is that the training is valid for two years, but we'd like 75% of staff members to be trained. Next slide, please. I don't know if people are aware, but this is the e-learning for health. So what they're saying is that anybody who has contact with a child and young person with asthma can undertake or anybody can undertake this training. T1 is recommended for school education staff and um, sports clubs or activity leaders. You, tier 1, 2 and 3 are free. Tier 2 is for health visitors, school nurses, public health nurses and practice nurses. But if people would like to develop, they can go on and look at, you know, tier, tier 2 training. Tier 1 is a 45 minute training session and it has some multi um, choice answers at the end just to check people's understanding and knowledge following the training and there is a certificate that you can print off. What, what the aim is that anybody who comes in contact with a child or young person, it's about making that difference and improving their asthma care. And if you've got this understanding with the training, you're going to be able to help them hopefully and support them in an emergency situation and make a difference to that child or young person. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of some resources, our local resources, Beat Asthma. We've also got Asthma in Lung UK and our Healthier Together. There's lots of information on Healthier Together and our, all our asthma friendly skills, asthma um, sports and clubs accreditation is all available on the Healthier Together website to download. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get off mute there. Um, thank you both, Carol and Claire. Um, I'll open up to if anybody's got any questions. Um, we did have a couple in the chat, I think, but Louise has answered those um, as we've went, as, as people have put them in the chat. Um, does anybody have any further questions? Johnny. 
Hello, sorry to bother you. Um, I offer some advice and support to schools and one of the questions we often get asked because we've been really pushing schools to get the um, asthma plans from parents is they were asking for clarity around those children that don't have an asthma plan and we're wondering if it's for a couple of reasons. One might be because of the age of them, perhaps they haven't had a diagnosis or one might be that they've had an inhaler prescribed and the parents are, are saying asthma, but it hasn't necessarily been prescribed for asthma. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah <laughs> you, you are. And I think that that is a little bit of a dilemma and it fits in with the bundle, doesn't it? Where it's, you know, important to get early and accurate diagnosis. But there are some children who sit between diagnosis in terms of, you know, they get called allergic wheezes or under under five wheezes or early years wheezes in that case they won't if they haven't got a definitive diagnosis they actually won't get um, an asthma management plan but what is available now um, and it's on beat asthma friendly website is also there is a, a wheezing plan which will be very similar but it's for those children that sort of fall through the net of diagnosis and sometimes it's appropriate not to diagnose a child if you're just thinking it might be just um a one-off response, for example, or it may be related to a certain season, but even then it, it's it's more appropriate to diagnose as asthma as possible and probable than it is to not diagnose. That was one of the outcomes from um, a report, a HSIB report of a child with a nameless death who had had several amount, several treatments for potential asthma but didn't ever get a diagnosis so i think it's careful it's and i think from that point of view we are encouraging all schools to try and get hold of management plans but it won't be possible in a percentage of children and i think as long as there's an awareness and, and the training has been completed of what of what to do at the time that that makes the child as safe as they can be but it obviously it's not on, a, on an individual basis, which is what a plan is, because the plan will vary with each child's individual presentation of symptoms and treatment. But there is a generic approach that you can make, as I went through that poster, that would pertain for any child. So as long as somebody's aware of signs and symptoms to look for and that the child's inhaler is in school, that's the safest you know, guidance that I can give. And ideally, they would have a written management plan, but it's not always possible. And I think the other thing, part of the work that Carol and I have also been undertaking is working with GPs and practice nurses. So we're, we've really encouraged them and trained them about the importance of sending the asthma management plans, either some, some are emailing them, some are sending them via text, like a link to children and young people's phones. But we've really encouraged that and the importance that skills are going to be asking for that and we have some templates on healthier together where skills can actually request copies of um you know plans or if they're concerned about a child's symptoms they can actually send a letter to the parents to say we'd encourage your child to have an asthma review um and ensure that they get a plan brought to school that template would be great i shall get back on it and i didn't notice that when i was looking around so i'll do that because i think schools don't know how far to push it because they like I say one school said to me oh well we've sent out all, we've asked for all these requests from parents for a plan and we've only got about 50 percent back some of the parents are saying well they've had an inhaler for years it just keeps getting prescribed but we've never needed it um and that was the kind of feedback we were getting particularly from secondary schools yeah we're asking primary care settings to actually look at their um their register of children who have asthma and actually look at de-escalating some of the ones that are just historical you know they've they had an, an inhaler when they were eight months old and it's still re-prescribed and re-prescribed particularly if it's just a relief inhaler on its own those children probably need to have their diagnosis revised um so it's important that throughout all healthcare systems we're all working together um to the aim you know to to be aware that this can be a problem and it and what problems it actually leads to if you leave a child with a blue inhaler but without a, without a confirmed diagnosis or vice versa yeah you end up with children who think well my brother grew up thinking he had asthma and and he didn't it had been for a, a viral kind of wheeze when he was about eight years old <laughs> yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you too. In the chat, um, Charlotte put, um, could the WEEZ plan be flagged to all GPs across NENC, please? I know Louise has responded about doing some work with primary care around pathways and working direct into practices to widen awareness and we're digitising um, referral pathways between primary, secondary and secondary and tertiary care um, and the information relevant links will be included in System 1 and Amos. I'm just checking, is that the same relevant in relation to Charlotte's question that you raised, Louise? Yeah, hi, hi, Laura. Sorry, I, I'm not quite sure what the matter is with my camera. It's on, and I, I, I'm just, sorry, I'm, you can't see me. Um, so the yes, yeah, so obviously, ultimately, this is around the, the referral pathways between primary and secondary. But as part of the guidance that accompanies that, there is information and links around all the available resources. So that's all of the beat asthma friendly personalized asthma action plan templates, all of the viral induced. Um, Wheeze plans, all of the links that are, all of the resources that are available on Beat Asthma will be signposted and made available in GP guidance notes as part of the, the work we're doing with CDRC at the moment to digitise all of that. Thank you. Does anybody <laughs> else have any further questions? Just conscious of time, we've got two minutes left of the session if anybody wants to ask anything. We will be circulating the um, recording and the slides once we get them uploaded um, to the website on Healthy It Together because we keep all of our lunch and learns on there. So I will share that um, once we've managed to get them onto there. Is that anything? I don't think anybody else has got their hands up and there's nothing else came into the chat. Um, Thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the session. Um, we do have some future sessions coming up with a focus on epilepsy and a back to school session covering common childhood um, illnesses that affect children in school on the 24th of December and, and the epilepsy epilepsy session in November, which is shared through our Child Health Tuesday um, to be able to book onto those regularly. Um, if you want to be involved, um, please do sign up to the network. If you haven't already, it will be included, the join and link in the slides. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, all. Bye.